and welcome to this special interactive edition of Global Conversation. In the studio today, we have one of Europe's most powerful women charged with some of the continent's most vital dossiers and who's not causing a bit of controversy. Vivian Redding is Vice President of the European Commission and Commissioner for Just and Citizenship. And this encounter has sparked quite a lot of social media. And our Mark Davis, our digital editor, is monitoring that. Mark, what are you up to? Hi, thanks, Isabel. So, for the last two weeks or so, people have been sending us their questions via social networks so that we can put those questions directly to Vice President Reading tonight. And people can still send those questions. The hashtag to use is AskReading. So if you have a question for Vivian Reddy, send it to us and I will do my very best to ask it either in the TV interview now or in the online session immediately afterwards when uh, citizens who will be putting their questions straight to the Commission Vice President. Mark, thank you. And Vice President, joining us on the Global Conversation. It's my pleasure. So you've been in the headlines for a whole host of reasons, not least the US spy scandal, where you were quite vocal and publicly thanked Edward. Really going to help EU-US relations. In retrospect, do you regret that? I regret what, that the Americans were spying on us. Very much, I do. So, do you wish this a little bit further? Do you regret that no European country went further and offered them asylum? Well, that is up to the member states uh, to offer asylum or not. But it is up to Europe to speak with one voice. Say very clearly to our American counterparts that to engage in business with us. That if they want. Uh, then uh, they need also to build on the trust. But the trust has vanished because of this spying affair. That neither uh, really appreciate that they are spied on commercially, nor do our citizens that they are spied on in their daily life. So we need to find the arrangements with the Americans in order to bring back the trust between the United States and Europe. So so in the internet world. So, and, and if we look at this issue of trust, I'm concerned that this spy scandal could derail a trade deal the U.S. This is kind of mixing two different things in some respects. Is that not a danger? Just teetering out of crisis. I said it will be dangerous. Uh, you need to have two trusted partners who uh, negotiate, and trust has been damaged. So uh, let's not, this question of spying, this question of um, destroying the trust in the Internet, derail the negotiations on commerce, because they are in the interest of Europe and in the interest of the United States. And that is why I think everybody waits uh, the uh, mm, speech tomorrow of uh, President Obama. He has been counseled by his expert group to uh, take bold decisions and to give give back a part of the trust which has been vanishing in the last months to the Europeans, to treat Europeans as we treat Americans here in Europe. And I'm waiting for this speech really to see if we can advance in the same direction, in a direction where we offer trust to the Americans and they offer trust to us. If we look at this question of trust, you've actually also said that, you know, in response to this, the Europe needs an intelligence agency to be on the same platform as the US. But you also said friends shouldn't spy on friends. That, that's kind of contradictory, isn't it? Now, I do believe that Europe needs to speak with one voice. If uh, we are fragmented, if one says one thing and the other says another thing, then we are going to lose any uh, credibility on the world scheme. And I am so proud about the European Parliament because they went uh, to Washington and all political parties say the same thing, that the trust has been vanishing, that uh, Europeans are very disappointed and very angry. 
And all political parties said it, I was saying it, and you see what has happened in the United States. The data protection question, the privacy question, which was not on the agenda, has come on the agenda. And members of the House of Representatives, members of the Senate have pledged that they would come towards the Europeans in order to have in order to help to solve the problems. Well we'll have to see if that actually happens in reality but in Europe in terms of data protection we're not protected. There's a bill that's been sitting on the table for two years. Our, our data protection rules date from the pre-internet era. Why are we not protected better in Europe? Oh, we are very well protected in Europe. I think we are the continent which is best protected in the world. And our data protection rules, which are anchored in the treaties, and uh, they date from 1995, so we are protected. But we have but to adapt... that was the pre-internet era. That was that is what I say. We have to adapt this protection to the new internet world. And there Parliament has voted with an overwhelming majority in order to get these rules reinforced and adapted to this internet world. I'm counting now on the Greek presidency, which next week will have a special session in Athens on the reinforcement of the data protection rules together with the ministers of the 28 member states. I actually think Mark is going to cut in here, I'm hearing. Mark? Yes, well, it's, um, it seems like... Uh... A good moment to ask this question that we've just received on Twitter from Stephanie Ho. Uh, she asks, Mrs. Redding, can you confirm the data protection package will be voted by the European for 2014 elections? So that's May. Well, <laughs> I am uh, not a Europarliamentarian, but I am in uh, constant uh, contact with the Europarliament, with the rapporteur and the co-rapporteurs and with the parliamentarians of all political uh, groups. And they have, yes, said that they want to vote before they resume for election campaign. In plenary, they have voted in committee, overwhelmingly um, backing the new uh, reform and they will also vote, and that I have heard from the Parliament, before um, uh, April this year. So we should have a law in place before the European elections, is what you're saying? A law should be in place after there has been agreement between the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers. This agreement cannot definitely be done because the Council of Ministers, the governments, are very late. The Parliament was a quick in order to defend the interests of the European citizens, the governments seem to be more slow. Governments and also some of the big internet giants, you're facing quite a lot of pressure from Google. The Google data chief said, and I quote him here, is much flawed and dead. What do you respond to that? But that I don't understand what they are saying. I just understand what the big companies are doing. They are stealing the private data of citizens without asking their citizens, the citizens if they want to hand out this data. This is against the current European rules. So what is done in this moment is completely illegal in Europe. And I hope we can stop this. We're going to have to move on to another issue now. But it's another issue where you're also facing pressure. And that's the European elections. Now, you've been touring Europe, engaging in citizens' dialogues. Europeans are more and more disaffected, more and more alienated. Why have you lost Europeans' trust? I do not believe that we have lost Europeans' trust, because if I look at our polls, uh, a vast majority of uh, citizens in Europe feel European. The problem is that they do not know what it means. But and no, no, then if you're going to, sorry, if, if you're going to quote a poll, a Eurobarometer poll just a few months ago showed that 60% of Europeans didn't trust Europe. Another, which was a Gallup poll, showed that only four countries four EU member states gave Europe uh, EU leaders an approval rating above 50 percent. So, well, well uh, I am not very happy to say this, but the approval rate for the European Commission goes 
higher than the approval rate for national uh, governments and for uh, national uh, political parties. So let's not uh, start to discuss about this. Two-thirds of the Europeans feel Europeans. One-third of the Europeans know knows what that means. And that is why we started these town hall meetings. We have made 41 so far. And um, uh, town hall meetings where people can ask questions, people of all level. And what I see in these town hall meetings that people say, somebody comes to answer this question. Now, do I, as a European commissioner, need to go downtown to the villages, to the cities, in order to answer questions of the citizens? I do believe that the national governments should do a lot more work in order to explain how Europe functions, who takes the decisions, and what Europe does for the citizens. I think Mark's going to cut in here, actually, with another question. Is that right, Mark? Yes, I've got a, another question for you here, and this, uh, this was received yesterday on Twitter by a user going by the pseudonym V23ID. She asks, what do you make of Osborne's Europe's reform speech? And just to put uh, that in a little bit of context, that's the British Chancellor, George Osborne, who said that there's a simple choice for Europe, reform or decline. Mrs Redding, do you agree with that assessment? Well, I agree with the assessment that uh, if you do not advance, you go back. That means you have always to reform, and uh, that is what we are doing. Day per day per day per day, we try to reform, we try to find answers to problems. So in politics is a normal thing. So, so what do you think then when we see people on the, the kind of the more radical side of politics and we know that Eurosceptics, well we, at the moment Eurosceptics are expected to make big gains in the elections in May. People like Marine Le Pen, the French National Front leader, who says that her intent is Europe. Well, um, that is interesting to listen, but I hear a huge majority of European leaders who has as an intention to reform Europe, to make Europe stronger, to but make Europe capable to speak with one voice. And you see, in democracy, it is the majority which decides. Yes, but there is a growing minority, as you are aware, and it's also in mainstream, as Mark said, it's the, you know, the British government who would like to see reforms which you might find unpalatable politically. But, for example, with freedom of movement, for example, to the, the British Prime Minister, who has suggested that he would use his veto on European Union enlargement to stop, to halt freedom of movement in Europe, or to curb it at least. What's your reaction to that? Well, let's go back to basics. The freedom of movement is one of the most cherished freedoms not of the by European everybody citizens. at the moment. And yesterday, not later than yesterday, there was a huge debate on the freedom of movement in the European Parliament. And there was a cross-party alliance, a huge majority of people who said, go for it, protect the freedom of movement, and that is also what the citizens say, that like all freedom, there are the rights and there are the obligations. There is a freedom to move wherever you want in order to work, in order to study, in order to make holidays, but there is not a freedom to move into social security and to uh, take advantage of this in an illegal way. There the rules are clear and member states can fix it. Now, let, let's take the example here of this country where we are now, of Belgium. I have to ask you to keep it brief, yeah. Yeah. Belgium has last year put out 5,500 European citizens because they were misusing their freedom to move. Most of them were French and from the Netherlands. So you see, it is very much possible that a member state goes for this, uh, fights the abuse, mm -hmm. but the right, the freedom, has to stay. We've been looking at the future of Europe. What about your future? At one point, you were touted a lot as a possible European Commission president. I'm going to have to ask you to be very brief here. But if you were asked, would you rise to the challenge? Well, you always rise to the challenge when you are asked to take responsibilities. I am now uh, rising to the challenge already three times as member of the European Commission. Uh, I have been to European elections five times because I do all...
a member of a government or when you want to become member of a government, you should also go for elections in order to get the approval of the citizens. So also if my party asks me to go to again to European election, I will fight an election campaign. Vivian Redding, many thanks for joining us on The Global Conversation. Now, this is where we end our global conversation with Vivian Redding, but the conversation is by no means over, so head straight over to Euronews.com. Mark Davis is raring to go, and he's going to be taking more of your questions in a special hour-long web chat with the Vice President, so do stay with us.